So, it is about time now that we got into the details of uh, dislocations and we shall start as I told with two extremes the edge dislocation and the screw dislocation. Now, uh, it, uh, if I look at a sample of aluminum under a TEM, we had pointed out that typically one finds a curved dislocation line. That means, there will all be a lot of dislocations typically uh, a simple sample of aluminum even if it is a well annealed sample you will find lot of dislocations uh, in a transmission electron microscope and when you if you take a deformed specimen like a deformed specimen of aluminum which has been maybe uh, deformed in any way then you will find that there are a lot more dislocations in the material. In fact, there is a structure of all these dislocation there could be dislocation cells which form there could be regions of high dislocation density and regions of low dislocation density as well. Uh, but essentially all these dislocations typically will be having a curved line they will not be straight dislocations. In other words as we shall see that these dislocations have a mixed character they do not uh, have a pure edge or a pure screw kind of a character, but they actually have a mixed character. And in fact if you notice that the percentage of screw and percentage of edge character and what we mean by these terms we will understand very soon by actually taking a curved dislocation change from position to position along the dislocation line. That means, if I take a point on a dislocation line which I observe under a transmission electron microscope it will have a certain character edge character and a certain screw character and the dislocation itself which is a mixed dislocation can be thought of decomposed into these two parts which are the edge and the screw extremes. If I take another point along the same dislocation line this percentages would change and therefore, the edge and screw character change along the dislocation line. However, we will see that there are very special circumstances where pure edge, pure screw or a mixed dislocation of a very fixed percentage can be formed and uh, a nice example of this would be the case of an epitaxial film of germanium silicon on which is germanium silicon solid solution on a silicon substrate and in this case you find 60 degree misfit dislocations form and these are straight dislocations and they are have a fixed character of 60 degree. Uh, misfit and what I mean by the 60 degree also will become clear when I take up the uh, edge and screw components of curved dislocation. And in this case of course, the angle between B and T is 60 degrees. Um, the edge dislocation is far easier to visualize far easier to understand and it is also uh, it is because that what we might call something it is associated with a half miss uh, extra half plane or a missing half plane and we will use the edge dislocation to understand many of the concepts regarding dislocations of course, we will also take up the screw dislocation uh, to understand many more concepts regarding dislocations. So, um, we said that dislocations play a very important role in plastic deformation they actually weaken the crystal and dislocation can be actually visualized as a boundary between a slipped and unslipped part of a crystal lying over a slip plane. Now, to show this so I have a some sort of a model here and you can see that uh, if I take a perfect crystal and then push in this part of the crystal that means, I am pushing it uh, making an operation where I am pushing in this part of the crystal. And when I do this pushing in here I will notice that there is an extra plane which was sitting outside here originally the original crystal extended till here and this is now one this extra plane has gone into the crystal. And in this case the extra plane has travelled to this distance from here to here and it is now sits in this place. Now, this extra half plane is a characteristic of a pure edge dislocation and now the crystal can this dislocation can be thought of as the boundary between a slip part of the crystal and the unslip part of the crystal. So, this is a way of visualizing a dislocation and often uh, this uh, kind of a visualization may not be possible and all we have to uh, uh, visualize is an edge dislocation by its mere character that means, the extra half plane for an edge dislocation. So, when I push in a crystal I can push in the extra half plane the extra half plane can travel of course, and even come out from the other side of the crystal creating a step on the other side and we will actually see these kind of steps as they uh, form using some other graphics. But now I can visualize this region which is now the slipped region. So, this is my slip plane the whole plane and so this is now part of my slip plane which is extending outside the crystal and so this slip plane which extends till here. So, this region of the slip plane is the part which has been slipped and the dislocation has uh, glided till here and this part of the slip plane is where the it is not glided that means, there is no slip in that part. So, a dislocation can be visualized as the boundary between the slipped and the unslipped part of a crystal. Okay. So, this is a way of visualizing an uh, dislocation 
and in this case it has been illustrated using the edge dislocation. When we talk about dislocations, uh, it has with it associated two important vectors. The two important vectors are the line vector T and the Burgers vector B. The Burgers vector perhaps is um, as cardinal to a dislocation as you can think of. Um, a dislocation is born with a Burgers vector and expresses it even in its death. So, it the entire life of a dislocation uh, even starting before its birth to its death uh, has this Burgers vector embedded or the signature embedded in a dislocation. The T vector is a unit tangent vector along a dislocation line and if you have a straight dislocation line the T vector is a constant okay. and you can obviously consider unit T vector also that means which is a uh, uh, fundamental la uh, lattice translation vector kind of thing which is a unit vector but also you can other consider other kinds of T vectors, but essentially it is a tangent vector to the dislocation line and for a curved dislocation from point to point the T vector will change. But the B vector is absolutely a crystallographic constant, it will not change e either with the screw nature of the dislocation or the edge nature or the mixed percentage of the dislocation, it remains a constant and it is determined crystallographically. And as we shall see it is the, it is the fundamental lattice translation vector for a full dislocation. So, let us start with uh, the Burgers vector of an edge dislocation and if you already have a dislocation then we can determine the Burgers vector using what is known as the uh, Burgers circuit and the Burgers circuit associated with the convention like, like the right hand finish to start rule which is written in shorthand as RHFS can give us the Burgers vector. So, what we are dealing with here is an edge dislocation and we are trying to make a circuit known as the Burgers circuit to determine the Burgers vector. But please remember even if I did not have a dislocation, it were a perfect crystal, crystallographically I can tell what is the Burgers vector. But if I already have a dislocation, then I can use the Burgers circuit to determine the Burgers vector. So, how do I come, uh, do this Burgers circuit along and typically I need a convention to define this and the convention has to be constant across. Uh, the various considerations in the problem and in this case we are using the right hand finish to start rule and I will explain what does this rule mean. So, what I do first I take a perfect crystal which is the crystal on the left you can see the crystal on the left which is the perfect crystal and I make a circuit that means I start from a point which is marked here start and I take 8 atomic steps to the right. So, it is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8 atomic steps to the right this is an arbitrary number I can choose any number of steps. Uh, it could be 8, it could be 10, it could be 40, but I just choose some number of steps to the right. Then I go down 7 steps and this again is an arbitrary number. So, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7 steps downwards. Then I take 8 steps to the left again and take 7 steps up. So, un not unexpectedly very obviously we land up exactly where we started off with. So, I land up where I started off with. In other words, a circuit like this closes on itself in a perfect crystal as expected. Now, of course, I could have taken a more uh, what you might call a more arbitrary kind of path instead of taking a square path. For instance, I could have started here and I could have gone down instead of going up here, I could have gone down like this, gone like this, gone like this, gone like this, maybe even gone up and so forth. But it is always simpler to take a nice uh, rectangular path the way it has been shown here in the figure. Now, what I do? I do the same circuit in the crystal with an edge dislocation. Now, you can see that you got an edge dislocation here and as I pointed out the edge dislocation is associated with a half plane. So, this is my edge dislocation, it is a dislocated crystal on the right hand side. Now, few important points about the edge dislocation which of course, I will also explain during the using the model that the edge dislocation is not the extra half plane of atoms, it is not a two dimensional defect it is not the missing half plane of atoms. So, you can see that you can even consider this as the missing half plane of atoms, it is not the missing half plane of atoms, it is in fact exactly between the two. So, you have the edge dislocation sitting right here going inward in the paper. So, this is a two dimensional section of a three dimensional crystal which goes into the plane of the slide. So, we will have a little more to say about the um, uh, edge dislocation with the model in hand. But now let us do the Burgers circuit. So, when I, st I start as usual from a certain particular atom around the dislocation and I stay far away from the dislocation line which is here. 
So, this is my dislocation line, I stay a little far away from the dislocation line and now I construct 7, 8 steps to the right, 7 steps downward. So, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, then down 7, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, I go 8 left and come back and not uh, as obvious you will not land up exactly where you started with and that is because now you have an extra half plane of atoms and that extra half plane has accounted for this mismatch. So, I have constructed what you might call a right handed circuit. I could have equally well construct a left handed circuit, but I am sticking now to the right hand finish to start rule. So, I construct a right handed circuit and at the end of the circuit I find that my finish point and the start point do not coincide with each other. And now, I use a rule which is the finish to start rule that means, I draw a vector connecting the finish point to the start point and that vector is the Burgers vector. Now, uh, this Burgers vector now which is typically written in symbol as a B with a ve vector cap on top or a bold B. So, is the Burgers vector and the modulus of the Burgers vector gives the value of the this vector. Now, um, it is clear that this is a lattice translation vector, it connects one point in the lattice to another point in the lattice and therefore, this is an important vector which is associated with the dislocation. Now, let me summarize this slide before we take up the model and try to understand the edge dislocation. So, first I, I take a perfect crystal, I make a circuit, the circuit could be very arbitrary, but typically I choose a rectangular circuit and I make the circuit in a right handed fashion, that means I go clockwise in this case. Then I take the same circuit and put it in a perfect crystal making sure that the uh, defected region that is my dislocation is included within the circuit and I stay my circuit is far away from the core of the dislocation and this being the region of the dislocation very I do not stay very close to it. Then I find that this right handed circuit leaves a small gap, I draw a vector connecting the finish point to the start point and this is what is my Burgers vector. Now, let us me try to understand this edge dislocation a little more. Uh, so, as I pointed out the edge dislocation is not the extra half plane. So, this extra half plane is not the edge dislocation, neither is it the missing half plane. It is in fact, the region the line exactly between the missing and the extra half planes which is what has been marked here. Okay. Now, important point to note if I go far away from the dislocation line the regions of the crystal suppose I have here in this case of course, I have not gone really far away, but if I really could go really far away the regions of the crystal far away from the dislocation line either on the upper side or on the lower side are perfect. So, this is a perfect region of a crystal. So, you can see you can measure the lattice parameters they will be as close to the farther you go the more perfect the crystal would get and, and similarly the regions far away at the bottom side of the uh, slip plane as we call them the plane of the where I my dislocation lies is also perfect. Now, a few uh, few points to be noted even here is the fact that if I have an edge dislocation sitting here, we will see that the displacement fields and stress fields to which we will of course, come later are long range fields. In other words, even if I go a uh, little far away there will be small disturbances to the crystal, but as long as these disturbances are small compared with the Burgers vector I treat them as 0 and therefore, I can treat that region of the crystal as a perfect crystal. So, what I will do now, I will take up the model and explain you some of these things. So, I have here a model now which is made of straws and you can see that in this model there is now an extra half plane of atoms which has been introduced. So, this is my plane of atoms. So, let me take up. So, this is my extra half plane which has been introduced. If you look at the crystal below, you can think of this region as an missing half plane as well. And this region of the dislocation which has been marked in blue, you can see here blue is the region which is highly distorted. That means, the bonds in this region are highly distorted and the crystal is highly distorted. This is the region wherein the stress fields and strain fields are very large. Now, another thing which you would notice is that the region here is also a region where there is some extra free volume. In other words, as compared to a normal lattice crystal which is far away which is now a perfect unit cell somewhere far away here. In this perfect unit cell you know the kind of voids which are present and you know the fraction of those voids like for instance if you take an FCC crystal you could have a uh, octahedral and tetrahedral void. So, we know all about them, 
but now if you look at this region there is an extra free volume associated with this dislocation and this is a very important thing and we will come back to this what is the effect of this extra free volume. Okay. Now, we can actually draw even a for instance a vector like this which we can call the Burgers vector, but typically this has to be drawn far away from the dislocation line. Uh, now, the dislocation line itself is the line which is here which is bet between the missing and the extra half plane of atoms. Now, what happens if I look at this crystal from sideways? Okay. Sideways we notice that the crystal nearly looks perfect. So, looking from this direction I cannot see the dislocation. So, the dislocation is best viewed from this direction and in this case the dislocation line is starting from the front face of the crystal and of course, you have only taken two unit cells here typically it would run a straight dislocation line would run and then the back side of the dislocation. So, it would the terminal first one terminal point of the dislocation on the free surface would be the front free surface the other would be the back free surface okay. and therefore, this is my dislo edge dislocation in a uh, single crystal. Now, an important thing of course, it is very easy to understand an edge dislocation because it has is associated with an extra half plane of atoms. Now, this plane on which this dislocation line lies is called a slip plane. Now, the vector t vector is nothing but a line vector which goes into the plane because now my dislocation is going inward and now my t vector is this pen as you can see which is the vector which describes the line of the dislocation. Because this is now a straight dislocation in this crystal my t vector is not changing from position to position, but if it were a curved dislocation line then not only the t vector would change, but also character of the dislocation also change as we shall shortly see. Now, the Burgers vector is now this vector connecting this atomic position to the next atomic position and this is my b vector. As you can see the t vector for an edge dislocation which is this vector is perpendicular to the b vector. So, my t vector is in this direction, the b vector is in this direction and the t and b vectors are perpendicular to each other. So, this is an important point to be noted and the t vector and the b vector together define my slip plane. So, the plane common to both the t vector and the b vector for an edge dislocation is my slip plane. Now, why do I call it the slip plane that takes us back to the experiment or the model in which we had pushed an atomic plane uh, pushed the side of a crystal. So, that we pushed in an atomic plane. So, that is what or a half atomic plane. So, the same thing can be visualized here suppose I push this part of the crystal and then therefore, I create a step on the surface and then this plane moves in here. So, this plane which is now the middle plane the plane residing here would be my slip plane and as we shall see by taking examples from face centered cubic crystals etcetera typically this would be a close pack plane in these kind of close pack crystals. Okay. So, so what are the things associated with the dislocation now let me revise. So, this edge dislocation is associated with an extra half plane of course, this extra half plane need not really be half it could end somewhere in the crystal only thing it should not go all the way to the crystal then it will be a make it a perfect crystal. So, it has some end somewhere within the crystal and therefore, it can be called though we use the word half we mean it does not go through all the way through. So, that is the first thing second thing it is associated with the line vector which is between the missing and the extra half planes it is associated with the Burgers vector which is a lattice translation vector connecting two lattice points. The t vector and the b vector together define the slip plane along which this dislocation line can move. So, if I had to shear this crystal for instance I take this crystal and I apply a shear on the top like this and of course, I will pull the bottom side to apply a shear like this then what would happen to this crystal is that this dislocation would move on the slip plane. So, how in which direction would the dislocation line move? So, this is my dislocation line direction this dislocation line would move in the direction of the Burgers vector. So, this important characteristic of the edge dislocation. So, the b vector the t vector defining the slip plane and the dislocation line in the presence of a shear would move along the direction of the Burgers vector. What would happen if of course, if the free surface it approaches a free surface the free th this extra half plane would come out and create a step on the free surface as we shall see with some graphic with graphics later on. The other point we noted using this model which is very clear is that this region um, which we shall use the word core and of course, technically the core is the region where the linear elasticity theory breaks down that means, the deformations are so large that you cannot use the linear elasticity theory anymore. 
and this region is associated with some free volume is known as the core of the dislocation. And typically the core of the dislocation is a region which can be thought of as something between a uh, of about few burgers vector in some cases it could be a burgers vector it could be about five burgers vector but some region between uh, of the order of a few burgers vector and this free volume as we shall see later is very very important in certain phenomena which we shall consider so this is a model of an edge dislocation and as we should take up some graphic models it will become clear that how this model is useful in understanding the edge dislocation So, going back to the uh, two dimensional graphic model, so the two dimensional uh, section where this uh, slip plane meets the front face is shown here in the blue line. So, that is my slip plane, the plane uh, the extra half plane is also here, the burgers vector has been drawn, the t vector is a vector which is into the plane of the board. So, it is into this blue line here. So, it cannot be shown in this diagram, so it is into the plane of the board and it is unchanging because this is now a straight edge dislocation. Now, this is an alternate way of visualizing the same. So, this is my extra half plane for the burger, uh, edge dislocation, the green plane which has been shown here. This is my extra half plane. This is my slip plane. Now, the t vector goes inward. Of course, this is not a unit t vector. I could always draw a unit t vector which is now shown in the blue colored vector and the b vector again uh, this is not a uh, crystallographically shown. So, therefore, you should remember this is just a schematic and this red vector is the Burgers vector. And now, the t vector and the b vector define the slip plane while the extra half plane contains my t vector. And now, if I shear my crystal, suppose I apply shearing forces on this crystal now, this extra half plane would move parallel to b and at a certain time it this extra the dislocation line could land up here and finally, of course, leave the crystal. So, since this uh, edge dislocation is associated with this slip uh, extra half plane, it is easy to visualize an edge dislocation and many of the characteristics of this uh, edge dislocation can be understood based on this kind of a construction. So, let us summarize some of the important things we have considered so far with regard to dislocations, the edge dislocation especially. A dislocation can be thought of as the boundary between the slipped and the unslipped parts of a crystal lying over the slip plane. So, um, again as I told you this is just a way of visualizing the edge dislocation and often it may if a dislocation exists in a crystal it may not you cannot tell which is the slip part or which is the unslip part. So, there is a question from Mr. Ravi. Sir, uh, dislocation that means mean dislocation line is an imaginary concept, it is not actually physically present in the crystal somewhere. Uh, very good question. Now, um, the first question we have to ask is that why is this dislocation a line? why is it not a region. Okay. As I pointed out whenever we were discussing the di uh, classification of defects based on dimensionality that we will make some idealizations. If you look at actually the displacement field of a dislocation which we will take up soon or the stra stress field, it is a long range field. The disturbance is not localized to that line, it is it is felt by atoms which are even quite large quite far away quite a few um, even uh, atomic spacings far away from the line of the dislocation. But nevertheless, uh, this is just a visualization that that is instead of now me understanding a dislocation as the displacement field of the entire atoms around it, I localize all my visualization to a line which I call the dislocation. And uh, later on uh, perhaps we will deal a little bit about the concept of an image force, there we will see that how we now not just worry about the line, but we can worry about the entire configuration of atoms around this line. So, definitely it is an hypothetical line, but since it is a line, it is a clear cut line which can be imaged in a transmission electron microscope, it is as real as any other line. So, the intersection of we have seen of the extra half plane of atoms the slip plane defines the dislocation line okay, for this is for the edge dislocation. The direction and magnitude of slip is characterized by the burgers vector of the dislocation. So, the burgers vector is perhaps a very important thing whenever we talk about dislocation, it is energy, it is stress fields, you will always find this burgers vector appearing uh, anything, anything associated with the dislocation and as we shall see that it will characterize the slip associated with the dislocation. So, this is something which I told um, I mentioned before that a dislocation is born or in fact even exists before its birth with a Burgers vector and expresses it even in its death. So, this point has to be noted and therefore, we cannot forget the Burgers vector when you are talking about a dislocation. 
the Burgers vector as we saw can be determined using the Burgers circuit and we typically use the right hand finish to start convention for determining the Burgers vector. So, this aspect we have seen already. Now, the periodic force field of a crystal requires atoms to move from one equilibrium position to the other. This implies automatically that the Burgers vector must connect one lattice position to the other. Of course, we are talking about for this for a full dislocation and later on we will be talking about something known as the partial dislocation also. And later on we will also see that since the energy of a dislocation goes as the square of the Burger, modulus of the Burgers vector, the dislocations tend to have as small a Burgers vector as possible. So, this is something which obviously, there you, you have the smallest lattice translation vector, you could have larger translation lattice translation vectors, but you the dislocation will always choose the smallest lattice translation vector. And another important point which perhaps we will return to later is the fact that dislocations are non-equilibrium defects and would leave the crystal if given an opportunity. So, if you take a if you take a sample of aluminum and I cold work it, then typically the dislocation density can go up to say 10 power 12 meter per meter cube. Then if I anneal this crystal, I will leave it at somewhat high temperature, so that there is sufficient thermal activation, then the dislocation density would reduce. And of course, there, there could be mechanisms like risk crystallization and recovery which are operating, but at the end of it you will land up with a low dislocation density which could be of the order of 10 power 4. So, a dislocation tend to leave the crystals okay, and it is of course, in this case we have seen they are leaving because of thermal activation. Now, let us next consider uh, the more complicated or, or let us say the more difficult to visualize form of a dislocation which is the screw dislocation. Now, uh, the reason these are called screw dislocations is can be seen from this figure that if I look at now, now this is my perfect crystal in which a screw dislocation has been introduced. Now, this is a that therefore, it is a crystal with a screw dislocation. If I look at now atomic planes, you can see that atomic planes of course, far away from this point are perfect, but if I go here and I start from this point and I make a loop around this, I would notice that I go inward, this is something like a screw. So, I, if I keep on traversing, I will keep going around inward as I travel along these kind of paths. So, uh, again I of course, I have models to explain how a screw dislocation works, but from this figure it is clear that like before, what I could do is that I could make a cut on the crystal, I take a perfect crystal, make a cut. So, this is my plane which I make a cut. I do not cut the crystal fully, I cut it only to a somewhere in between to this point say P and then I take the upper part of the crystal and shear it with respect to the lower part. That means, I push one part this side and push another part and I make sure of course, that these atomic positions land up on top of the other atomic positions. Okay. Therefore, now what I have got is a screw dislocation. So, if you look at a region far away from this dislocation line, it is perfect if I look at another region above which is perfect, but the region here has which is close to where the cut ends is the region of high disturbance. Now, again I can make a burger circuit in this structure in which case what I do I start I make a circuit in the perfect crystal and reproduce that same circuit in the defected crystal that means in the presence of a dislocation. So, for instance in this case I have made a circuit which is the right handed circuit I start from this point here start say 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 I go down, then I go 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, then I go 6 back at uh, 12, then of course, I came back 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12 and then I do the same thing to the right hand side come back and not unexpectedly I do not land up in the same place and using the finish to start rule in the using a right handed circuit, this is now my burger sector. So, how did I, uh, so let me repeat the process, how did I make my dislocation? I took a perfect crystal, I cut along this blue kind of a plane, so the assuming that the whole plane goes inward, I cut this blue plane, then shear one part of the crystal with respect to the other and of course, join this to the next plane of atoms. Originally, this row of atoms here were stuck to this row of atoms here, but now I move and join them to the next parallel row of atoms and therefore, I get a uh, after joining now, I get a sheared crystal and this is now my dislocation line. 
So, far away from the dislocation line everything is perfect, but here there are large shear stresses close to again what I can call the core of the dislocation. Now, uh, let me explain the same uh, using a, uh, a model, so that this, uh, these concepts become clear, but now uh, in this defected crystal I can make a Burgers circuit as before and now using the right hand finish to start I can determine the Burgers vector. An important point to be noted straight away is that the dislocation line which is now of course, going inward into the crystal from this point onwards is now parallel to the Burgers vector. In other words in this case the line vector which is the T vector is parallel to the Burgers vector. Okay. So, let me use a model to explain the concept of a screw dislocation. So, here I have a screw dislocation and the way of course, uh, it has been constructed is as, as I mentioned before and here the red line is the line of the screw dislocation. So, let me keep the crystal like this for you to understand this. So, this part of the crystal for instance originally this plane of atoms which is coming from here originally would have been stuck to this point. So, this point originally would have been stuck to this point, this point would have been stuck to this point, this point would have been stuck to this point. So, what I did I took a shear here I made a cut in this crystal here moved this plane of atoms from here to this next and joined them. So, you can see if I look at my this region of crystal which is far away it is perfect, if I look at my this region of crystal it is perfect the unit cells are perfect, but here somewhere here is region which is highly distorted the bonds are highly distorted. Originally this atoms would want to join for instance this atoms this bond would have liked to join with this atom for instance it would have joined here this bond downward should have gone here, but is now joined shifted therefore, there is a distortion. So, there is a high distortion of bonds around this place which is costing energy to the crystal. Now, my dislocation line is this red line which I can shift a little bit and show you. So, this is my red line here which is the dislocation line and this is my Burgers vector which is B which is also here. So, this point joining this point can be thought of as the Burgers vector and therefore, this Burgers vector is parallel to this dislocation line. So, if I look at my crystal again you can see that these planes are bent they are sheared. So, this this is the shearing direction of course, is this that means I have taken this and pushed my crystal in this direction towards me that means my shearing operation is going like this that is before joining I make a cut that is of course, this cut is of course, hypothetical I am doing a mental construct to get this dislocation the mental construct goes as follows I make a cut in this crystal here I shear the crystal and join what whatever originally this bond must have gone here I put it here and therefore, I get planes which are now bent around this place okay. and if I now travel along a particular plane I would notice that I go like this I go like this and I come back I go do not come back here, but I come back one step backwards. So, I go here for instance in a perfect crystal of course, I go like this like this like this like this I come back to the same place, but here if I go like this like this like this and I go like this and I I shift myself I land up here one shifted and this is what is my Burgers vector. So, um, in fact, if you are watching this video then you should actually spend a lot of time looking at this model and perhaps try to make these kind of models yourself because these are just made out of straw and uh, simple connectors because a screw dislocation is much more difficult to visualize as compared to uh, a normal edge dislocation which is associated with an extra half plane and clearly here there is no extra half plane and as we shall see later even the stress fields are quite different or very very different between an edge dislocation and a screw dislocation. Now, this region of distortion around this dislocation line is again is so large that the elasticity theory would fail down and therefore, this region I would call the core of the dislocation, but now uh, this core of the core region is not associated with the kind of free volume we are, talk we are talking in the case of edge dislocation and typically we will see later that a screw dislocation would interact with um, other kind of defects which have again a shear field associated with them. So, once again I will summarize uh, what is use this model of a screw dislocation the in a screw dislocation um, if you look at now let me show a small comparison of the edge dislocation in this edge dislocation there is no there is a bending of planes, but now the bending of planes is like this it goes and it just comes down as you can see these planes. So, these planes are bending like this, but there is no shearing of planes but in the case of the screw dislocation as you can see that these planes are bending in this direction which is not 
which is considerably different from the case of the edge dislocation. And also the Burgers vector is parallel to the dislocation line. And now suppose I shear this crystal, I how would I shear this crystal? The same way I created the dislocation I would shear, I would pull this region top and push this region. So, I am shearing let me show from the side. So, with the dislocation line perpendicular to you suppose I am shearing this crystal. What would happen to this crystal is that now this region where the, the this plane ends this where the dislocation line starts would tear up a little more as we shall see using graphic videos which will make it absolutely clear and this dislocation line would move towards me. In other words of course, it will move in the case of the edge dislocation the dislocation line was moving of course, in the direction of the Burgers vector on the slip plane and now this is my slip plane and now my Burgers vector is in this direction and but the dislocation line is moving perpendicular to the Burgers vector. So, this is an important difference between a screw dislocation and the edge dislocation and how when this. So, this extra step you can see here has been created by this dislocation and as this location keeps moving the step would propagate downward and the finally, you will find that this whole crystal has a step here this whole crystal downward that means, this dislocation line when I shear would leave even though I am shearing in this direction you can see I am shearing in this direction the dislocation line would move in this direction and finally, it will leave the crystal from this back face and leave a complete step along the crystal. So, this is what uh, is considerably different from an edge dislocation and this is what makes visualizing a screw dislocation uh, uh, somewhat difficult, but uh, using models like this perhaps we can have a better understanding of screw dislocation. Very good question. As I told, Burgers vector is determined by crystallography. It does not matter if I have an edge dislocation, it does not matter if I have a screw dislocation. The Burgers vector is a constant that does not change. What can change is the line vector, right? And if it can be a straight dislocation, then the line vector is a constant, it can change from point to point, but along with the change of the line vector, so is the character of the dislocation changing because now as when we list it you see that the line vector is parallel to the Burgers vector in the case of the screw dislocation. In the case of the edge dislocation the line vector is perpendicular to the Burgers vector, but suppose the dislocation line now suppose I am starting with the case like this of course, we have better uh, graphics to show you that later. Suppose I had a straight line like this this is my dislocation line and this is my Burgers vector and this is my line vector therefore this is clearly an edge dislocation, but some other part of the crystal it could so happen that I have a line vector like this the same crystal of course, my T vector so, this is my T 2. Now, this has a pure screw character, but the Burgers vector remains the same this is now my B I do not have to redraw my B it is only the T vector which is changing. Of course, I could have a dislocation in which it goes like this that means, my T here is a tangent vector here at this point P at this point it is a different direction this is my T 2 or T this say call I call this T P and I will call this point say x then this will become T x and some other point will again be a tangent vector this will be T z. So, this is my point z so forth. So, line vectors can change, but the Burgers vector is a crystallographic constant which does not change. Another important difference uh, of course, between an edge dislocation and a screw dislocation is that um, the kind of screw we have constructed is what I call a right handed screw and there is just there are two kinds of screw dislocations the right handed screw and the left handed screw while there is only one kind of an edge dislocation which is the normal edge dislocation which we saw. So, structurally there are two different kind of screw dislocation the right handed screw and the left handed screw. In a right handed screw dislocation as you make these clockwise paths you will go into the uh, plane of the board while if you make the same kind of circuit you will come out in the case of a left handed screw. So, let us summarize the geometric properties of dislocation which we have seen. Now, um, so we have seen there are two extreme possibilities when it comes to dislocations the edge and the screw we talk about the relation between T and B in the edge dislocation. In the case of an edge dislocation the Burgers vector is perpendicular to the line vector while in the screw dislocation they are parallel. The slip direction will always be parallel to B it is does not matter it is an edge dislocation or the screw dislocation the slip will be determined by B 
that is very very clear. So, there is no doubt about that. Um, so, it again we should not confuse the motion direction of the dislocation line to the slip direction that is some, something which is not to be confused. Suppose you look at the direction of dislocation line movement relative to B, then in the edge dislocation the B the dislocation line moves parallel to B and the screw dislocation it moves perpendicular to B, but the motion of the dislocation line is not the slip direction. The slip direction has to be defined separately with respect to the motion of the dislocation line and the slip direction is always parallel to B. The slip step will always be finally, when the dislocation leaves the crystal it will be parallel and the step will be created which will have a magnitude B. So, this has to be absolutely clear. Uh, additionally, we will note of course, this is uh, we will note later that a dislocation of course, we have defined a slip plane can leave the slip plane and it can do so for a screw edge dislocation by a process known as climb and for a screw dislocation by a process known as cross slip. So, these important geometric properties of dislocations have to be kept in mind at all times and this is what will uh, determine their role when actually they uh, determine slip that is uh, their, their role in plasticity. Now, let us take up dislocations which have a mixed character that means they are neither pure edge dislocations nor they are pure screw dislocations. Um, in fact, we had noted already that only under special circumstances that dislocation would have a pure character and mostly they would have a mixed character. And typically, if you have a curved dislocation line, the edge and screw character would change from point to point. So, this is another thing. And if you have a curved dislocation line, as in the case of a loop which is shown here, a dislocation loop at the bottom figure, uh, there are only points exactly only one point or couple of points wherein the dislocation would have a pure edge or a pure screw character. So, let us see look at this dislocation loop now. So, this is now uh, and as we shall note later that a dislocation line cannot end within a crystal and one of the ways they can end is end on themselves forming a loop. So, this is now a dislocation loop in the crystal okay. and now um, the Burgers vector is drawn here of course, this is a schematic and therefore, this Burgers vector remains constant irrespective of which point in the loop or take it is entirely a constant of this loop constant for this loop. This plane which I have shaded here is the slip plane. Now, let me draw so show the figure on the right you have this burgers uh, this uh, dislocation loop and now in this dislocation loop you can notice that there are points where the t vector for instance is perpendicular to the b vector. So, this point obviously is of edge character as I go down you will see that the edge uh, the dislocation line is changing its character. So, this my t vector rotates it comes to an uh, it becomes horizontal then it rotates even further here and then finally, it becomes opposite direction and rotates s. So, from point to point along this loop the dislocation line is changing its t vector and also its character. At this point you can see the point here you can see that the burgers vector is parallel to the t vector and this is obviously pure screw character. Then if you go down here you will see that the burgers vector it becomes perpendicular to my uh, t vector and this is again edge character and this is again going back here will become screw character because now here my t vector as per parallel to the uh, burgers vector. So, typically in a curved dislocation line any point would have a mixed character and therefore, as I go from point to point the character of the dislocation changes. A few important questions can we can ask that how do we decompose this dislocation into the edge and screw character and how do I visualize uh, understand at each point here. Your question, sir. Uh, what do you mean by positive and negative uh, edge and screw dislocation? Very How good question. We, we will just come to that in a moment. So there are some slides regarding that also. Now this is now not a full curved dislocation, not a full loop, but this is a quarter loop as you might call it. And in this quarter loop, you can visualize the edge and screw components much better than in the case of the full loop. So in this case, you can see that. Um, as before I told you um, that a dislocation cannot end within a crystal it has to end on the free surface or as we shall see later can end on a node or it, it can close on itself forming a loop. In this case the two ends of the dislocation line this end which is marked S and the end which is marked E are ending on the free surface. But the important thing to note is now this is my Burgers vector B and therefore at this point the line vector which is the tangent to this T vector is parallel to B course, I am using uh, uh, more casual language I am not using the word anti parallel, but in, in the same sense. Now, um, 
therefore, this is a pure screw character this point and you can clearly see that how this slip plane which is now this plane which is shaded in yellow is has been sheared to create this point. But now, the dislocation line which is a curved line comes out and in this edge in this point the b vector is perpendicular to the t vector now the t vector is inward and into this on this plane on the same slip plane and is perpendicular to that. Therefore, this is a pure edge character here and that can also be seen from this extra half plane which is present. So, this pure edge region has this extra half plane. So, clearly you can see that this curved dislocation line has one terminal point E wherein you can visualize the extra half plane the other point E which is purely like a screw with shear fields like that means it is got the shearing pattern which is very characteristic of screw dislocation. But if you just concentrate on this region this corner you can see it is very because it is like pushing in the part I was telling pushing in one part of the crystal with respect to the other and therefore, that edge character is reflected here the pushing in part. But if you look at here it is like if you look at this region it is like more like a shearing part that I have sheared this crystal and therefore, this is the screw part. Uh, so, in a sense uh, understanding these mixed dislocation is somewhat or much more difficult than understanding these pure components and uh, the only way perhaps to easily understand them is to actually decompose a given dislocation into its screw and edge component and try to understand what is their contribution to uh, the material behavior. So, this is a nice example wherein uh, you have a quarter loop which, ha which has screw and edge character its terminal points, but anywhere in between along the curved dislocation line it has got a mixed character. So, how do I decompose now my uh, uh, dislocation into edge and screw components to uh, understand my uh, the edge and screw character. So, typically the way it is done is that uh, and there is a word of caution here before uh, I proceed further that the Burgers vector is a crystallography constant and here I am resolving the Burgers vector merely trying to understand its edge and screw component. It does not mean that the Burgers vector has changed direction. So, that point has to be noted and an alternate way to uh, we will see later to understand certain other aspects of dislocation we can actually in fact resolve the t vector rather than the b vector. So, I take the b vector and resolve it into a components parallel to the t vector and perpendicular to the t vector. So, here this is my pure edge part this is exactly the same kind of loop I considered before a quarter loop which has one end which is purely edge character and one end which is purely screw character and now my Burgers vector is in this direction b as shown in this figure. So, I have a b vector which is in this direction and this is obviously the b vector is parallel to the t vector which is in blue color therefore, b is parallel to t and it is a screw component and here this is an edge component and in this case as I as we saw and of course, the whole plane of this uh, slide is the slip plane. Now, so this is my slip plane the whole plate of this is my and now if I look at this dislocation loop then I know that the line vector for an edge dislocation contains my extra half plane or the extra half plane contains the line vector and which is what I have drawn here as a thick line here which is my extra half plane. Obviously, no such extra half plane is visualizable for the screw dislocation or the mixed components that easily, but we will come in the next slide to understand how we can draw an effective extra half plane, but before doing so we will understand how to resolve this b vector. So, I can take my b vector and resolve it into a component now that this point for instance p. Now, the t vector or the line vector is the blue vector which is going like this you can see the line vector which is shown in blue color and I can resolve my b and assuming that now my uh, angle between the line vector and the Burgers vector is theta. So, I can resolve it into a component parallel to the line vector which is b cos theta and a component which is perpendicular to the line vector which is b sin theta. So, the perpendicular component I am showing in orange the um, parallel component I am showing in green and therefore, my screw component is has a strength of b cos theta and the edge component has a strength of b sin theta. So, let me revise the whole comp, uh, thing again. So, I have components of the mixed dislocation at point p it has got an edge component and a screw component. I find the edge component by first of all locating the angle between uh, the tangent vector at point p which is the line vector with the Burgers vector which is given by an angle theta. Then I resolve the b vector parallel and perpendicular to this line vector. The parallel component is the screw component because we know for a screw vector b is parallel to t 
is the screw component shown in green and it has a got a magnitude of v cos theta while the perpendicular component has a com magnitude of v sin theta which is now my h component. So, at every point along this dislocation line theta is going to change because the angle between the b and the t is going to change and therefore, my the contributions to um, my Burgers vector is going to change or the components the screw and edge component are going to change along this dislocation line. So, therefore, I can resolve a mixed dislocation into parallel and perpendicular components and did understand and therefore, perhaps for instance understand later on its stress fields and strain fields. Now, um, I can do another trick the question I can ask further is that I have already drawn an effective uh, an extra half plane at the point E which is a pure edge part. I have also drawn the pure screw part which is at s right. How can I now try to understand where is an effective half plane. So, it has got an edge component obviously, it is not does not have a, a extra half plane the way it can be visualized usually for a pure edge dislocation, but can I still visualize an effective half plane and how do I do that. Now, what I do instead of resolving the b vector I resolve the t vector. So, I resolve my take my t vector and resolve it parallel to b and perpendicular to b. So, when I resolve it parallel to b I get this t cos theta and perpendicular to b I get the t sin theta and now I can draw an effective extra half plane like here which is shown in this figure which is now parallel to the original extra half plane, but it has got a thickness which is reduced by the factor of t cos theta okay, or t sin theta. So, uh, we have so far considered so let me revise what we have considered so far. So, far what we have considered is the edge dislocation the screw dislocation and the mixed dislocation. We also understood the important vectors associated with the uh, dislocations and we have understood the relationship between those two vectors the b vector the t vector and and how they are different for the between the edge dislocation and screw dislocation. But we also seen that the Burgers vector is a constant for the entire dislocation line. Uh, the next topic we can take up is a topic on motion of dislocations two kinds of motion of a dislocation are possible and uh, as we saw why are we considering the motion of a dislocation because of the role of dislocation motion has on plasticity. Of course, there are other roles we have already seen uh, of a dislocation, but here we are concerned with plasticity mainly. Uh, the two important modes of mo dislocation motion are glide and climb and we will first focus on glide motion of the dislocation. And typically a dislocation would move under the action of an externally applied stress. And we have already noted at the local level shear stresses are responsible to move a dislocation line that means, even though macroscopically we may apply tensile other kind of stresses if we do not have shear stresses at the slip plane level that means, the slip plane does not face a shearing stresses then a dislocation cannot move by gliding action. Now, there is a minimum stress you need to apply to move a dislocation and this is this stress is called the Pearls Navarro stress or the or to move in a shorter form the Pearl stress and sometime also referred to as the lattice friction stress. So, again when I am talking about these kind of stresses these stresses are at the microscopic slip plane level and not the macroscopic stresses which you apply externally to the macroscopic specimen. Um, and we as we already know even though if you, you might have a tensile specimen and you may be purely applying a tens tensile load, but at the microscopic slip plane level. So, if you have a tension specimen for instance which is cylindrical tension specimen the horizontal plane and the vertical plane do not have any shear stresses, but every other inclined plane would face a shear stress and therefore, these shear stresses can drive the motion of dislocations leading to plasticity which is what we see a strain or the plastic strain when you do a uniaxial tension experiment. Now, um, so, this part of uh, this understanding is very very important because often uh, uh, we have to understand at the microscopic level to cause plasticity by slip or glide of the dislocation we need only shear stresses. Um, dislocations may also move under the influence of other internal stresses for instance arising from other dislocations precipitates uh, and we will also take up the case of a free surface or those stresses which are generated by phase transformations. So, there could be internal residual stresses which could be even for instance residual thermal stresses which can lead to the motion of dislocations. So, even though we may not have an external uh, up externally applied shear stress there could be these other internal agents which could actually be giving rise to a shear stress at the on the slip plane finally, leading to the motion of a dislocation. 
dislocations are attracted to free surfaces and also some uh, interfaces with softer materials and because of this attraction also they may move and this force of attraction between a free surface and a dislocation is called the image force and we will try to understand later why is it called the image force and how does it affect uh, my dislocation. Now the minimum stress as I pointed out that you need to exceed so that a dislocation moves is called the pearl stress and if you have a stress applied on the slip plane which is less than the pearl stress the dislocation would not move. The value of the pearl stress is different for the edge and the screw dislocation so this point has to be noted and an most important point is that uh, the merely motion of the dislocation cannot be considered as a plastic deformation and of course when we are talking about a gross macroscopic plastic deformation we are talking about the collective motion of a, a, a huge number of dislocations but at the microscopic level or at the atomic level the first step of plastic deformation still involves a dislocation moving on its slip plane and leaving the crystal to create a small step of Burgers vector length. So, when the dislocation uh, leaves the crystal it uh, creates a small step and this step can be considered as one small step for a dislocation but a giant leap for plasticity because we, if this step does not occur as long as dislocations keep moving uh, within a single crystal there is going to be no plasticity. But the step as I pointed out when we had discussed the topic on understanding dislocations we said this single motion of dislocation has perhaps negligible contribution to overall plasticity or macroscopic shape changes and therefore there we need to consider collective motion of a large number of dislocations along with what we may call intersections of dislocations etc. But nevertheless this one step which the dislocation creates when it leaves the crystal is the first step of plastic deformation uh, or the first small step of plastic deformation but then this is the underlying mechanism for most of plasticity which includes for instance a rod of aluminum which I may bend to a new shape. This small step is only a b small b in height and dimensions but then if many many dislocations leave the crystal on the same plane uh, it this you could create a large step which could be hundreds of burgers vector in height and if you take a deformed specimen of copper and then uh, see it under a, even an optical microscope you will see lines on the surface which you call slip lines and these are coming from these large steps which have been created by many many dislocations moving on the slip plane and leaving the crystal. But when this dislocation leaves the crystal it relieves all the stresses associated with it and it is now only a surface step and no longer it can be called as a dislocation. So, it ceases to exist as a dislocation it leaves its final mark as a small step of height b or the or width b on the surface. So, this is where we can consider the dislocation to have died or left the crystal. So, let me summarize this slide dislocations can move on the slip plane and this process is called glide uh, edge dislocations can leave a slip plane and this takes place by the portion of a process known as climb. So, edge dislocation only can climb um, later on we will see that screw dislocations or follow an alternate path to leave the slip plane which is known as cross slip. Now, the reason the dislocation move has to always be a shear stress at the on the slip plane and this can be from an externally applied shear stress or from one of the residual stresses present within the material. So, it could be one of these and um, it could also be a free surface the influence of a free surface which is now causing the dislocation to move. The minimum stress you need to exceed for a dislocation to move is what is called the pearl stress or the internal friction stress and the reason for this is very simple because we when you look at an edge dislocation for instance in a picture we go we go back here it is in a metastable equilibrium state it is means even though it costs energy for the crystal and this dislocation would like to leave the crystal but nevertheless it is locked in a small energy minima a small valley therefore if I have to move this to the this dislocation from this position which is marked here to the next position which is exactly identical crystallographically that is why this is now a burgers uh, this slip is characterized by the burgers vector which is the lattice translation vector therefore this movement has to go uphill in stress or uphill in energy and therefore I need to apply external stress. So, this is the stress I need to overcome so that the dislocation moves and we already seen that this stress is orders of magnitude smaller than shearing an entire crystal. So, finally if I am crossing my pearl stress the dislocation will begin to move and finally it can leave a crystal and create a small step of Burgers vector height which is which is perhaps the first step towards any kind of plastic deformation. Now as I pointed out the motion of an edge dislocation can be conservative which is 
the motion of a dislocation on a slip plane is called a conservative motion and if the edge dislocation moves perpendicular to its slip plane, the slip plane means a particular slip plane, then this process is called climb and it is a non conservative process. When I mean a non conservative process, it that means that it involves mass transport. Motion on the slip plane just involves shear stresses, but motion from one slip plane to a parallel slip plane would involve mass transport and we will see how that is so. Because now the climb process, so let me see. So, suppose now I have a dislocation sitting in the crystal here and now this is my slip plane. Now, if this slip plane has to move to the next slip plane parallel to itself, then automatically this row of atoms where the dislocation ends has to remove be removed. And of course, how this can happen is that this row of atoms can actually move in the crystal and go and suppose there were a vacancy somewhere in the crystal here, this row of atoms could go and sit in the vacancy and therefore, the vacancy concentration in the crystal would be reduced, but this row of atoms would be got rid of and therefore, now instead of this being my slip plane, the slip plane would have moved one step upward and this will be my slip plane. So, non conservative climb of edge dislocations involve motion of um, some mass transport and suppose I am now talking about this slip plane going downwards that means, I am talking about a negative climb that means, slip plane is coming down from this plane to the next plane which is parallel to it automatically that means, that I need a row of atoms to come and condense here and obviously, that means, that this row of atoms has to come from somewhere within the crystal and this would for instance, this, this atom could diffuse and come here this would actually lead to an increase in vacancy concentration in the crystal. So, positive and negative climb are possible leading to the uh, change in slip plane upper above or below for an edge dislocation and this negative climb as we saw involves addition of plane of atoms and, and so this is not just merely a one atom here, but an entire row of atoms going into the plane of the slide and therefore, I need to add an entire row and this would lead to a positive or negative climb. So, let us focus on glide first and in this case you can see that if I am applying shear stress on a crystal you can see that my dislocation is now here sitting in this place. So, as I apply shear stress you can see that the dislocation is slowly moving to its right side. So, it has come to the next position, it has moved a little further down here and finally, it uh, of course, it comes little more towards this, this right surface and finally, it leaves the crystal creating an extra step. So, this step height of the step is of the order of b. So, this is my b this step. So, in this case there is a dislocation within the crystal the second case also there is a dislocation in the crystal, the third case and the fourth case, but here there is only a surface step and there is no dislocation in the crystal. All the stresses and energy associated with the dislocation have been relieved, but, but a little extra energy is involved in creation of the extra step, because now there is an increase in surface area, but nevertheless the dislocation this ceases to exist when it is leaves the crystal. So, now this deformation which has been created here is permanent and this will remain in the crystal. So, when I am talking about a motion of an edge dislocation of course, you can simply visualize this in a even a two dimensional figure that actually this is my slip plane now and the dislocation is moving from one step to the other and therefore, finally, it leaves the crystal. Motion of a screw dislocation is slightly more difficult to visualize and these set of slides hope to make you understand how the dislocation moves. So, you can clearly see suppose I have a perfect crystal on the which is shown on the top figure here, then I have a figure with a dislocation line which is shown in red here right and when the dislocation line moves. So, this is my now my curved planes here when the dislocation line moves inward into the crystal the part which is sheared keeps on increasing. So, it moves here from this and then downward here you can see that it is what here and finally, to more he more here and therefore, finally, you can see that um, I think the, the path is after this I think the next sh uh, slide should be this one after that this is the next larger shear, then it this one is the next larger and finally, this larger and the this is the last step before which the it leaves the crystal creating a step. So, here on the bottom right hand figure you can see that the dislocation has left the crystal and created a step. Now, the step the dislocation was moving in a direction into the crystal. So, it was the direction of motion of the dislocation while the step has been created on the right hand side. So, this is something which is very important very different from the edge dislocation, wherein the dislocation was moving on the right hand side and the step was also created on the same side. So, here the step has been created on the right hand side and this is like tearing a crystal and producing a step on the right hand side. So, 
this blue plane in this case which is the plane between the top and bottom half is now my slip plane. In both cases of course, I am finally getting a step of distance b. So, this is my, my step of Burgers vector height that much is very clear. So, this is my surface step which has been created by the motion of the screw dislocation and as before all these stresses associated with the screw dislocation are relieved and but a small energy is added to the formation of this extra step which is now a surface step. 